agriculture, work, teaching, and all the things that people do in everyday social life, for which the word social should be reserved. Politics is the realm where people manage their communities by themselves. And the Greeks provided an astonishing example of a consciousness of that, as well as a practice for all the limitations that they had. And anybody who wants to go into these limitations, I will show you the Greeks were far less limited than Romans and all other civilizations in the Mediterranean. Every one of them was a slaveocracy to one degree or another. If you want to call the Greeks a slaveocracy, they were. And almost every one of them, if not every one of them, was patriarchal. Leaving that aside, the Greeks created something new. They created something which was not a professional apparatus called the state. They ran their own cities insofar as they were free, and insofar, in the case of the Athenians, they were of Athenian ancestry. In the case of the Spartans, they were, and I don't particularly love Sparta, they were of Spartan ancestry. But I'm mainly focusing on the Athenians who really gave us the culture that we normally call Western culture, whether you like it or don't like it, or whatever your opinion on it may be. So politics must be seen not as statecraft. Today, the people in running the city of Montreal, or running the province of Quebec, or running Canada, or running the United USA, the United States, all of those people are engaged in statecraft. All of them are being paid. I don't know what the fuss is about the banking scandal in Congress. There's a scandal every inch of Washington's way. You couldn't take one step into one corner of Washington, one rat hole in Washington, not to find the scandal. So this is dirty politics. But that is not politics. That's my point. My point is this is dirty statescraft, or statesmanship, or call it whatever you want. If that distinction is not kept in mind, we lose our sense of what we have to recover, what we have to find again, what we have to recreate in our midst, what gives us personal sense of confidence. Because the state tells us we are all idiots, and therefore the state must run it for us. We can drive cars at 70 miles an hour, or worse, more rapidly. Or we can crash airplanes all over Hawaii and whatever airport you particularly prefer seeing a plane crash. We can, for example, engage, carry guns into warfare. We can do all these things. We can make steel, we can do everything you like, but we can't run our own society. Only geniuses like Reagan, brilliant minds like Jerry Brown, wonderful, outstanding statesmen like George Bush, not to speak of the rest of the canale, canale that are running the world today, they can manage life. You are an incompetent. Or juridically speaking, the city is the creature of the state. This is literally a juridical term in the United States. The city is, in quotation marks, the creature, close quotes, of the state. And its citizens are really no longer citizens. They're constituents, they're taxpayers, or they're dopes. But it doesn't make any difference. All are equally interchangeable. So it takes great minds like a Reagan or Nancy to help them, and so on, to run the state, to run your life for you. Otherwise, you can torpedo right out there on the highway at 90, well, I don't know what kilometers, at 150 kilometers an hour. That's okay as long as the police don't catch you. That you can handle. A car you can handle, but you can't handle such a heavy and weighty decision whether or not to try to eliminate homelessness in the city. Now, you must understand what that does to you. Not only what it does to society, it degrades you and it defames you. And statescraft's personship, if you want to use that word instead of manship, but why not call it statesmanship? Statesmanship, since most are males, statesmanship is the idea that you are a client and they are your boss. And they're plucked out of society to manage your life. So this distinction must be kept in mind. The Greeks did not hold that view. And here we come to a point that I was not able to take up last time round. And this is the question, not of politics, but of citizenship, which forms the building blocks of, if I may use that expression, of politics. The basic notion that the Greeks had, or more precisely the Athenians had, and those who supported them, was that every uh, indigenous, if you want to call it that, or uh, a, a native-born Athenian was everyone, irrespective of their social or economic class, was competent to manage society. Whereas the state assumes that you are incompetent and must be regulated in the management of society, and only it can do so, the Athenian political notion 
And the idea of politics in general is that you are in fact competent to run society. And that is an enormous difference between the modern conception of how society should be managed, both in terms of politics and in terms of statesmanship. Use whatever word you want, statesmanship. Those are two absolutely contrasting notions. And therefore, the Greeks were not interested, or whenever I use the word Greeks, I'm referring to the Athenians. And you see I'm on a speed drop here because I'm trying to make up for that book. Uh, the Athenians worked with the assumption that you have to become a citizen, and after a certain age, and going through a certain training, character building, not simply being educated like going to school for X numbers of years or going to a university for X numbers of years, you were therefore competent in your trade once you passed the license. And then you could go on and be an idiot for the rest of your life. Maybe stop reading, stop thinking, just practice your craft or your profession. For the Athenians, the idea was fundamentally different. From the moment you were born to the day that you died, you were busy, in a sense, educating yourself. And not only educating yourself intellectually and spiritually, but also educating yourself on the ongoing basis of forming your character. So they call, they, they have, there is no word in French, English, German, yeah, there is a word in German, Bildung, which literally means building up yourself, Bildung. Character formation. That notion of character formation, in addition, as part of your education, is encompassed in the Greek word, and I'm going to mispronounce it for anyone who knows Greek, but you'll have to take me for what I am, a New York barbarian. Okay? That's what the Greeks would have called me anyway. Because I would say ba 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 by talking New Yorkese English. And that meant I was a barbarian. I didn't talk Greek. So therefore, the Greeks had a word for that, and that word was paideia. P-A-D-E-I-A, -A, pa -pa -pa pronounce it as you like. Nobody even knows how they pronounce it anyway. None of them are alive right now to tell you. And there were no technical codes in that. So paideia, or paideia, was the way in which you went through the education of becoming a citizen. Not of going to school to learn something, but of becoming a citizen. And what was involved in doing that? Because I did not discuss that really at all. The first thing is that Athens itself set itself up to be an educational institution. The whole polis was not only a way to live, a way to achieve happiness or eudaimonia. Again, I'm going to be struggling with the Greek words here because I'm always conscious that there's a Greek sitting to my left who knows more Greek than I do. Okay, but eudaimonia or happiness or, you know, enjoying well-being, but additionally, the school, Athens itself, was one ongoing school. And it conceived, and this is the important thing, it saw itself that way. Just as, and one may agree or disagree, the church saw that being a monk was an ongoing process, and the Greeks were anything but monks, since they usually walked around when they couldn't make it. Okay? And they drank wine. And they did all, well, monks. But the idea, just as in a monastery, you are living the Christian life, and thereby becoming a more of a Christian every day, so in a sense, living in classical Athens during the 5th century BCE, before the contemporary era, meant that you were living the political life. And every day you were becoming more and more of a citizen. That was the point. And that paideia, therefore, was structured into the city itself. The city had the Agora, which was approximately 35 acres. Pretty roughly, one might say, a square. Not particularly rectangular, not particularly triangular. More or less a square. The center was called, and we use this word to this very day, the orchestra. And lining it at various points, particularly the southern portion, and if my memory is correct, the western portion, and to a certain extent, even the northern portion, were arcades where you could go into to continue your discussion in case the weather was inclement. So you always had a kind of porch, not a porch, a covering. And they were beautifully done and lining much of the, at least three sides, approximately three sides, of the agora, or agora, the 
depending again how you want to pronounce it, were shops. And in a sense, the whole agora was partly a, whole, a marvelous circus, a bazaar. People were juggling there, people were drinking there, people were arguing there, people were selling there. Everything was going on, and people were philosophizing there. That's where you get the word Stoics as a school of philosophy, because their main area where they engaged in their philosophizing was in one of these arcades. So the layout and city plan, I love that word, the city plan of Athens, classical Athens, was literally, in a sense, a way of engaging in Paideia, a way, in other words, of developing yourself, to become a citizen and engage in politics, and then manage the affairs of the community. So one has to piece this into one whole. You can't separate it into parts. And you have to look at it holistically. And then on top of that, the Agora, the, uh, the city itself, had the theater of Dionysius plus another theater, where it performed these enormous recapitulations on festivals of the origins of the city. And how it came about that the city broke from the kinship tie into the civic tie. How it went from being a tribes, parochial, locked into themselves, in which only real or fictive kin were to be regarded as human beings in a sense, and anyone other than them were less than human, whether you were hospitable to them or you killed them. Made no difference. Now how that arena, civic arena, emerged from the blood cry, and most of us know this as the Oresteia, the famous trilogy of Aeschylus. But then Sophocles took it up, and other Greek playwrights took it up. All of them, above all, stressing that the polis was the realm of the emergence of reason. And the Greeks, the Athenians, were intensely self-conscious of this. You see, this was not a thing that fell on. It was not a thing they stumbled into by accident, although you can trace even many of the historical accidents that led to it. But ultimately they came to a subconscious awareness that Athena was not simply a guardian spirit who had sprung from the head of Zeus, but Athena was the expression of rationality. And their city, Athens, was a center of reason, not of Teutonic myths underground, dark, barbarous myths. Indeed, the polis itself seemed to be resisting the chaos of the outside world. Through order and law. Order and law. From blood vengeance, from arbitrary violence, the polis had to pass into an orderly and lawful world. And the Greek word for that was cosmos, meaning order, and law being nomos. And there had to be discourse. So the polis created, as it was, spheres where a young person and an adult could continually go through this education by living in the polis, no more. Just by living in the polis. So as you went from the orchestra, if you want to call it that, in the Agora, to the theater of Dionysius, you saw the recapitulation as part of a sacred festival of the emergence of reason out of disorder, out of the emergence of cynicism out of tribalism, out of the emergence of citizenship from kinship. And the city was structured that way. Additionally, there was on the Pnyx, or the hillside, the assembly. And at the assembly, people would come up after being permitted to do so, you know, raising their hand or indicating that they wanted to speak, they would come up and address. Usually a minimum of 5,000 members needed for a quorum. And there there would be the discourse from morning to evening in which the most fundamental decisions were made. Now the PNIX itself was a structure organized to teach you to become a citizen. And you could go to that, and you could listen to it. And even if you were a foreigner, you could hear it. Because Athens was a completely open city. And Pericles in the funeral oration takes pride in the fact other cities put walls around them. Okay, we have walls only for protective purposes, and they only reared a wall with the beginning of the Persian Wars, or in the aftermath of the Persian Wars, when they were invaded by the Persians. Until then, Athens was not a walled city. And the walls that it had were open to anyone. 
So they said even spies can come who are our enemies and can spy out anything they want. He says this in the oration and I merely paraphrase it. We have nothing to hide. We are open to everyone. And we are, and we take pride in the fact that we are the education of Hellas, the education of Greece. And for us, everything, people are all individuals. They all have a right to their own private life to live the way they want to. We call upon them to recognize that what makes it possible is that they are in service and we glory in the fact that they are in service to the city. And Solomon, incidentally, in this respect was amazing. A century and a quarter before that, Solomon literally passed an ordinance in which he declared that you could be kicked out of the city or suffer capital punishment, not if you were on the wrong side of the civil war, but if you didn't participate at all. That was the worst punishment of all. That was the biggest crime, to have no view on an important issue. That was far worse than being wrong. Wrong, you could be ostracized. Wrong, you might be killed in battle. Wrong, you might be accepted again if you were contrite. Wrong, you might be accepted if you were prepared to present your view in a civil fashion. But to be neutral, that was the biggest crime of all. Uh, was, one has to grasp the beauty of this conception to understand what a thing in life was. Not that they disallowed you the right to disagree with both parties. That was okay. But you had to have an opinion. But to hide out, to retreat from an issue, that was by far the biggest crime. I'm trying to push so much in. Please forgive me. I have a question if I could. Yes. Uh, just about your... Um, um, with the sage of reason and uh, uh, versus the Dionysian aspect. Uh, I didn't quite understand what you meant, what, what happened to the Dionysian element at this point. What they did was absorb it. <laughs> this is something that I think Nietzsche would have done as a good deal of good if he went into greater detail. They recognized that you have to have relief, <laughs> you see. So what they did was allow the mysteries to come in. And they had the lesser mysteries, and I talk, talk upon their festivals now, and the greater mysteries. The lesser mystery was the one in the beginning of spring, and the, law, and the greater mystery was the one toward the autumn. And you celebrated twice a year the mysteries. Additionally, they allowed offices, office, offices in it. The, the Eleusinian mysteries were an integral part of Greek religion. They absorbed the Eleusinian mysteries. In short, they absorbed the most Dionysiac, Dionysiac Dionysiac tendencies within everybody's character. And they gave it civic expression. That was the point. So they had festivals which were meant to be Dionysian in character. And in addition, they had ostracism. When somebody got out of hand too much, they exiled you for 10 years. That happened to Thucydides, and they never forgave Pericles for that. <laughs> okay. So they, they, they ostracized you, but they didn't kill you normally. In fact, it was very rare for a Greek, an Athenian, to kill an Athenian outside of you know, personal uh, afflictions and so on and so forth. So the Dionysian element was absorbed, and it was given create as much creative expression as possible by the poets. And so they had the city Dionysius, or Dionysia, which was the most important annual festival of the city. In that city, Dionysia, they literally engaged in the Dionysian festivals, and they also exorcised the destructive aspect of the Dionysian element through the plays. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Aristophanes, buffooning and laughing at everything and turning it to ridicule, including, incidentally, let me tell you, the mysteries themselves. See, for which you could be ostracized if you did this in private. But doing it in public meant that you were acting like a citizen. If you did it in private and made fun of the festivals, as was done, you could be ostracized. You ran that risk. So, and that raises a very important element of how the uh, Athenians incorporated all of these personal impulses, which we tend to associate with the, quotes dark side of human nature, how they managed to absorb it into, if you want to use the word co-opted, but the point is, it was not a sleazy co-optation. It was a way of showing that evil is part of our life. Darkness, not evil, darkness is part of our life. 
And the ultimate darkness is death. And the great, one of the great themes of Greek tragedy, I could carry it away when I talk about this, so I hope you'll indulge me. The great theme of Greek tragedy is that you must die. And how are you going to die? In other words, how are you going to greet one fate? Okay? That was the theme. And the question is, how are you going to live according to the canons of Daikin justice? Okay, those were the questions. The question was, were you such that finally when death could face you, either in battle or through accident or whatever, or of the ultimacy of diseases and death and mortality, how you would face that death is a major thing. And this was an expression of to what extent had you constructed your character to function as a complete all-rounded, harmonious human being. There is nothing that I know of in the history of humanity, and I say this not as a Greek, without a Greek gene in me, to tell you nothing more inspired than the consciousness that this had to be so. You see, people have done this or that part or whole fragment, but they've done it often unconsciously. If not until German classical philosophy could reflect upon it. You know what I mean? When you get down to, to, to uh, especially Hegel's insight. But leaving that aside, when that self-reflection of a later age, a thousand years later, that you were aware of their awareness of what they were doing, and knew what they were doing. And you must read Pericles' funeral oration to find it all. And not only that, they even secularized religion to a degree where the holy days, literally, and I quote, almost quote, become holidays. <laughs> that is to say, Pericles, and again, thought the greatest oration truly of the ancient world is that funeral oration, which was read and re-read by thousands of Greeks and Romans throughout antiquity, and has survived happily to this very day among the remains of their Greek, of that extraordinary I'm not going to say magnificent, because the future is yet to be contoured, you know what I mean? But that extraordinary culture, you have yet to read it where he says, we are not completely engaged in scolding, in work and toil. He said, we take pride in the fact that we have leisure time. I'm scolding, you have to correct me on these expressions. And he uses that term. And he says, our many festivals give us the leisure. You see, he no longer casts it in religious terms. Our many festivals give us the leisure, the free time, the ascoli, to finally, you know what I mean, indulge and understand ourselves. And who is to make statements like that in, in history? You know what I mean, in the course of human history, before or after the Greeks, with a few exceptions. Of course, I can cite them, but there's no point going into that. Because they didn't have the context Heracles was talking to an audience of thousands who understood him. That's the point. And he talked to them a written speech, read it to them, and he read it to them quietly. And they listened to it quietly. It was a funeral occasion. They were burying dead from a major battle in the Peloponnesian War. And they were faced with their plague. Okay. And there, at that moment, he celebrates the poets. Now, this takes me to the question of forming a citizen, and I want to be as brief as possible, and it's kind of ridiculous to try to do this, as I indicated that. A young person, born particularly as a male, and let's face it, it was a patriarchal society, as a male, was almost, from the moment that that individual could walk, the moment he could walk and talk and relate to somebody, was immediately treated in a very distinct way. And now she was a child, and they had found dolls and toys and whatever you like among the Greeks. Remains, of, in other words, of child and cribs and all the rest of them. But then afterward, the moment he was of an age when, say, about six or seven, he could begin to speak, he immediately, and perhaps even earlier, nobody quite knows. He was immediately, if the family could afford it, uh, surrounded by tutors. He was permitted to play. He was permitted to live what we call a childhood, as the Greeks understood it. But instantly, he was subjected to education. And the education was not in philosophy. <laughs> Please, 
Let's not, let's not mystify the subject. The education was very simple. How to play the flute and how to play the lyre. And above all, to learn the poetry of the poets. To learn the poetry of the poets. And what was that? The great epics. And what was that additionally? The history of the poets. And the, all of this was recitation. To read was secondary to speaking. Logos meant, and logic meant talking. And as I pointed out last week, once talking stopped, violence began. Hence the civilized and rational way, which combines word with logic and the term logos, both meaning, the word logos meaning both reason and speaking, was to recite. So the all important thing was to recite. And recitation, which involved memorization, a manuscript being held only if you managed to stumble and forgot a passage, so that, you know, you, it was, the, the written word was the prompter. It was to recite. So immediately that threw you into a public world. The world, public, that public world could be very small. It could be only three or four people as a, at a symposium, which was really a drinking party, together with singing. But by the way, their singing was not what I was, what you hear on FM today. And uh, recitation of poetry and recitation of great deeds. And these deeds were on various levels. And recitations about the gods. Hesiod was, the theogony was recited and memorized by the average Greek child. And by average, I mean just ordinary crap people. I'm not talking of the so-called aristocracy. To learn to do this was something that was in the air. And it was never, or the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were basically aristocratic. So that Homer was always there for the craftsperson. I mean, not Homer, Hesiod was always there for the craftsperson. He was a Boschian farmer. And he made no pretense about it. He hated the aristocracy. He called them robber barons, in effect. And the Homer was there for the aristocracy, or both were brought together, which was quite often the case. And then they recited plays, or passages from plays. And they had an endless repertoire, 99% of which has been lost to us, with the burning, certainly, of the Alexandrian library, when the Muslims took over and said, whatever is in the Koran isn't worth keeping. <laughs> and let the fire gut out the whole uh, Alexandrian market. But anyway, 99% of it is lost. But what we do have in the case with that, we try to learn. And this was, recitation was always done musically. So you had to learn how to improvise and play music to your recitation. And your music was your music. It was not the music. You know what I mean? That had been standardized and popularized. This is speculative, because nobody quite knows what Greek music is how ancient Greek music was like. This is speculative. But from the vases and the diagrams and everything that I have collected archaeologically, you played as you recited. Okay? Then afterwards, having learned this, the young child was then conditioned to be sensitive at the same time to learn great deeds and wonderful stories, often of a suggestive the next step in one's education went from that. Question? Huh? Please? When, when you referred to the child earlier, you were saying that it's male children? O only it? male children. Women okay. were taught one thing, how to weave and how to learn the Greek language so they could speak and how to cook. Okay. I am making no bones about yeah. the fact that this, you know, and I want to say something if I may. Is that okay? You know, I don't like to look back 2,000 years on what people did 2,000 years ago. We are so bright, we are so brilliant, we have invented such magnificent hydrogen bombs. We have such wonderful organophosphorus nerve gas compounds that we certainly are in much better position to do better. But please, take them for what they were. Be historical. Was it any better with the Egyptians where they didn't even teach you how to write? Writing was exclusively a priestly prerogative. Priests and scribes, and nobody else took write. The Greeks taught, the Athenians taught all their children how to write, and how to speak, and how to be public figures, and they were all males. But name one area in that whole area, including Crete, if you please. Crete, you know, the, the Knossos, the, the, the home of the goddess, and tell me for one reason why you should think that they did not have one or another form of patriarchy, 
or patris, patrocentricity, one or another form of the most grim superstition, and now, as we know, a good deal of human sacrifice. The latest digs out there do not support the garbage that is coming out from a good deal of the eco-feminist movement these days. A good deal of infants were sacrificed. The Greeks did not practice human sacrifice. They totally banned it. And that is incredible. And their most serious, except for the most exceptional purposes, form of putting someone to death was by drinking the hemlock. And you have only to read, you know, Plato's account of how Socrates dies to see what a painless death that was much better than many of the ways in which we go through these things. So I just want to make that justification, if I may. Oh, I beg us to be historical and put things in the context and time where they belong. It's very easy to be judgmental when one finally has spotted wings and become an angel in the 21st century, while 40 chernobyls are ready to blow off in the east. Okay? Let it go with that. I hope you don't find my remarks offensive. I'm just trying to get at this ahistorical mentality that exists, as though, you know, they had it way good down there in the Neolithic or in the Pleistocene, but now, you know, just more awful. So we can reflect upon that, and we can appreciate its limitations, understand its limitations, and appreciate the glory that was ours. And let me take it still further. After that, you went into gymnasiums. Now, there were three gymnasiums outside the world, and this will amuse you. You also could go into a wrestling school. Those were the two options you had. And you learn the martial arts, because you have to defend your city. You see, they didn't hire other people to do it for you, like recruiting people into the army. You know, They didn't hire blacks the way they do in the American army, way out of proportion to the population to do the fighting in Desert Storm or in Vietnam. Every citizen was expected, male, to engage in military service for two years after the age of 18, after which he could now inscribe himself in his so-called deem, or if you want to call it tribe, and it wasn't a tribe any longer, it was really a place of residence and could thereby become a citizen. Now, let's take it further. You could go to the gymnasiums, and guess what you found at your gymnasiums, besides calisthenics and all the rest of these things? That's where the philosophies were. Most people do not know that the word academy does not mean school. Academy is named that after Academia, who was a Greek hero. And that was the name given to a gymnasium that Plato established a house nearby in order to teach students. So when you use the word academic, you're really talking about a guy called Academia, who you don't know anything about, and I don't know anything about, and for all I know, nobody knows anything about, who is known to be a hero, probably in the war against the Persians. And if you go to the Lyceum, which Aristotle was supposed to have founded, he founded nothing. There was a gymnasium called the Lyceum, and it was named after one of the smaller deities. So that these terms like Lyceum and Academia are actually gymnasium initially, where, and given the, frankly, bisexual proclivities of most male Greeks, made it possible for philosophers to talk to young boys and by the way, the Greeks were not in any way adverse to doing this, and to also establish concomitantly a teacher, a far kind of what we would call a role model, oh God, I hate that language, a type of father figure, and someone to teach you. And Plato's academy was nothing more than an extension of the academy gymnasium, as it was known outside the city walls. Similarly, Aristotle's Lyceum. And many people just don't know this. So that the youth could immediately make contact by the time he, generally around 14 or 15 years of age, and going up to 18 years of age, after which he had to engage in military service, make contact with the finest minds of the Western world. One of those, what it must mean to be taught by a Plato or by a, uh, an Aristotle is something that is dazzling, frankly, to anyone who reads any of them. Dazzling. These were the true founders of Western culture. They were connected with what? A boys' gymnasium. And the names of their schools were exactly the names of those gymnasiums, or gymnasium. So you went through this process, and parents were only too glad if a Plato or an Aristotle was prepared to accept you as a student, and even as a bedfellow. 
But more important than that, it's not that they were a bedfellow or that they were, you know what I mean, bisexual. The relationship of a philosopher to a student who may have been 20 years younger than him, or more than 20 years, 30 years younger than him, was basically not only as a father figure but, and a role model, but as a companion to whom one went for advice, and for advice on the highest possible level. Age was respected because age, in fact, can did confer a great deal of wisdom. And one went to battle with one's teachers or one's love. The Greeks marching into battle did not march in Solomon's lives. And this is an important component of what is called paideia, that everything was, in a sense, civic. Civic in the sense, I don't want to use the word corporate, civic in the sense that there was an organic grouping, and you were always moving through either one or another type of organic group. This group could be your friends with whom you grew up, and those loyalties were unbreachable, unbreachable, unlike any of the loyalties we know today. We talk of a Mark Twain, and a, a Mark Twain, a Huckleberry Finn and a Tom Sawyer rubbing blood together in the cemetery in Mark Twain and saying we are friends for life. By the way, the rubbing blood is very tribalistic. It's a sign of kinship. But we know that uh, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer are going to go different ways. Not with the Greeks. The Athenians and friends formed in, friendships formed in early childhood and youth and childhood and youth lasted for life unless there were very serious differences between them, which could be political, by the way. Such friendships were a lifetime, and Plato's passion for Socrates, that is to say, his sense of philea, of solidarity with a group, one group after another group after another group, and as it were, in concentric circles, the circles widened. You moved through that world of groups, yet you did not lose your individuality. And this is celebrated by Pericles. We do not, no one, we do not allow others to interfere in our own affairs, to try to control our own minds. Here, I'm probably using a much later language, but that's the sense of what he's saying. Yet, we form one entity. We are one polis. And some of these concentric circles, you move through life, first with your earliest friends, whom you may retain for your whole lifetime, members of your freight tree, which was the equivalent by uh, classical times of what could be called a fraternity, people whom you met in the gymnasium, the philosophers and teachers who taught you were your lifetime teachers. And when they died, being older than you was a source of as great an, an internal agony as was the death of a parent who was deeply loved. And moving outward finally into the city itself and into its different political tendencies, you moved in that world. And that's what the Greeks meant by making citizens. And they did this consciously. And then you participated in festival after festival after festival, most of which asserted the unity of the polis. Not that you had to agree with a political policy. That isn't the point. That you could disagree. Solomon made very plain. In fact, the worst thing was not to have any opinion. The real thing that counted was that you were loyal to your polis, because your polis was your home, it was not your nest, it was the soil out of which you, as an Athenian, emerged and incorporated into yourself. And this idea that you had an ethical, not simply a religious, union with that polis was the essence of Greek citizenship. Through that education, and we have nothing to compare with it. There is nothing in this world, and I don't give a, give a hoot whether one refers to an Indian tribe, which may seem to approximate it, but has an introverted solidarity, or whether one talks to one's, you know, monkish monastery, whatever you want, groupings, which are not called upon to have their moral capacity. There's nothing to compare with that. And that is what formed citizens. And once people met on the picks to make decisions or go into the various councils and do all the things that they did in the service of the city, and remember, at any given point, 8% or more of, city, uh, of Athenian citizens were involved each year in managing the polis. Almost one out of 10 adults, males, were managing the polis at any given year, and there were continual relationships such that you couldn't hold the same position more than two years at most with the exception of the Slavagoid generals, who could always be reelected, 
But you could not hold the same position more than twice, and in most cases you couldn't hold it more than once. So the whole management of the polis run, ran through the polis like blood coursing through the heart. And not a shame. And that's what you have to try. I, ask, I would ask, that's what I think is necessary to understand what the Greeks meant by being a citoyen. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Any question before I go on to what I'm supposed to be talking about? And I'm sorry to have missed out my hour, but this had to be conveyed. You have to get the feeling of it. Did you use Padilla in the same way as Mortimer Adler used it? What? Did you use the word Padilla in the same way that Mortimer Adler? I never read Mortimer Adler in my life. I'm terribly sorry. No, he wrote, he wrote a book entitled Padilla. I know. Padilla. Yeah, but he didn't invent that word. There's a three-volume book that was written 70 years ago by Werner Jaeger, which will give you an idea of what Padilla meant. Three volumes, each one of which is approximately 400 pages. And it's still available, at least the first time. And he doesn't tell the whole story. <laughs> you have to study everyday Greek life to get the story, because Paideia was everyday Greek life. Our sense of every day is nothing compared to the Hellenic sense of every day. Our sense, mine, no less than yours, is nothing compared to the idea that every day had to have a certain pregnancy. No, I don't agree that in that sense, especially if he's been interviewed by what and, and, uh, well, forget about it. A very popular former speechwriter for Johnson, President Johnson. Moyers. 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 If he's interviewed by Bill Moyers, I have a problem. I avoid almost every one of them. I don't call him that I'll leave that alone. This is my private predilection and my pie data. Any questions, please, on what I'm trying to describe? You've got a feel of what I'm trying to describe. Um, were there any other um, instances in history of any cultures pertaining that sort of similar uh, idea? Not consciously. And I'm going to go into them. The Italian city-states, and they were to a great extent states, and many of the German city-states understood that. But you'd almost have to go into religious movements, and they immediately channel you. <laughs> Whereas the idea of Greek paideia was to become all-rounded play the lyre, to recite poetry, to be a fine warrior. But you think that was all? To learn how to build a house? To know how to, uh, well, women did the weaving, to be sure, to know how to cultivate food. Many of them were farmers. By far, the great majority were people who had farms right outside the city walls. And then to engage in the politics that I'm trying to describe, not to speak of being a conversationalist, learning philosophy. I mean, it depends upon how you want to upgrade it. At that particular point, I don't know people who tried to go reach those summits. And I will admit that there were pieces, and even several pieces, in any particular form of, uh, you know what I mean, any, 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 any city state. They certainly don't exist today, where narrow specialization is the ideal way to function. The less you know about everything else, and the more you concentrate on one single line, the more likely you are to get, quotes, a job. The more you are to engage in school day, which would point to the fact the Greeks generally felt was not your purpose in life, to engage in toil, or ponos. The point basically was to have a school day, to have the leisure time to drink, and the festivals supply that in part as a group. But the symposium <coughs> was a very important life, an important part of Greek life, and there was a special room for that. It was called the Andoron, from which you, which you get the word Andrichin. I need not to tell you. <laughs> it was one special place where the men gathered, drank their four parts of wine to two parts of, I mean, two parts of wine to four parts of water, drank and had heteroid, played and talked with them and conversed with them. By the way, there was a whole segment of the uh, small one, but a small segment of what we would today call there's no word for it. If they're not prostitutes. They're female companions. And they were, to be as informed, I told you the female companion of, uh, I mentioned this in passing, of, of Pericles wrote some of his famous speeches. And he married her, and that destroyed a wonderful relationship. Like a Japanese geisha? No, that's not. You see, the geisha serves you. She sleeps for you, she serves you, she may even dance for you. But imagine. If you want to call it a geisha, a woman who can converse with you about metaphysics, <laughs> or science, or 
whatever geometry was being formulated at the time, because Euclid was a later figure. Or reason with you, or discuss state of affairs, and finally help you write your speeches in the, in the, at the clinics and at the assembly. And do that not only for anyone, but to do that for a paradise. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, in my opinion. <laughs> then you got a picture of the, well, where do you find that sort of thing? She's not a courtesan, she's not a prostitute, she's not a gay she's not any of those things. She's something different. She's a total companion and, and of mind as well as body. Since 99% of the documentation was destroyed by that fire in Alexandria to which you referred, uh, what, what, are, what are the chief sources on Pericles and the Golden Age? We have its enemies, <laughs> and particularly Aristophanes, caricaturing him. We have Thucydides, being fair with him but hating him. We have Xenophon, and then we have a large part, number of memoirs and scribes and scrolls and so on and so forth and histories and outside observers, and people who come later on, say a century or two afterward, and Plutarch, finally, who gives you his whole autobiography, his whole biography, such as it's worth. But that is one of the major sources of uh, you know, Plutarch's lives of great Greeks and Romans compared. And there you have a, a tremendous biography of Solomon, you have a biography of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Pericles, and the point is we all know that Plutarch has one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world most of which now is gone forever. Do you think it would be possible... Do you think we could move it around? Yes, right? so I just don't want to make it into a dialogue. No, exactly. Anyone else, please? Yes. Has there been any studies of um, matriarchal uh, society? What? Any, any studies of matriarchal society? I can't follow you. I don't know what you're talking about. Of matriarchal relative patriarchal society. Oh, that was no such thing in the world. And every, every serious anthropologist knows that. There were patriarchal societies and there were patrocentric societies and there were matrocentric societies, but never matriarchal. There was never a society where women ruled over men. In fact, many feminists and rightly so would object to the idea that women would dominate. Wasn't Any there, other question? Wasn't there um, like like how the men I'd like very much to stick I don't want to be please understand me. I've got such limited time, I've just used up one half of my time discussing things I should have discussed the last time, that if I were to go into the ins and outs of anthropology, I would really be stuck. One of the best things you might want to do one of these days is to invite me back to a leisurely series of lectures in which we can have discussions. But at this particular point, let's stick to this, otherwise we're gone. If I ask matriarchal society, patriarchal society, if you give me anything on magic or whatever, I'm not saying you as such. You must understand my position. I'm speaker. You have to read that book. No, I'm, I'm just wondering about the, the rise of statesmanship that's related to the uh, male dominance. Well, I don't want to go into that now because I have a whole book called The Ecology of Freedom that devotes a whole chapter to the rise of hierarchy. I beg you to read it. And it's available by Black Rose. <laughs> Please? Any other questions? Can I go on? Because I'm really trying to speed back and this is ridiculous. Now, I want to make certain things very plain. Before I go on, to what is really what I'm supposed to be talking about as of an hour ago, but I didn't have the opportunity. And that is to say the transition to the uh, from politics to statecraft. I want to explain something that's very important. The area that we're talking about had a rainfall of approximately 20 inches a year. Your rainfall here is easily 40 to 50 inches a year. Europe, north of the Alps, or at least the northern parts of the European continent, had rainfalls of approximately 60, 40 to 60, uh, depending upon the area, talking about 40 to 60 uh, inches a year. In the Mediterranean, much of the soil was sandy. Now this is important to know, because we do not understand the rise of uh, the medieval towns, which we are going to discuss shortly. Those towns in the, age, in the Mediterranean world had a sandy type of, had a sandy type of soil. Their way of plowing was very different. They used, they didn't require any metal shards, you know what I mean, on their plow. They, they could just use a branch. And if they, in fact, plow too deep, there would be uh, a loss of sort of lower soil form, a loss of, there would be wind erosion, okay? The soil would disappear on the blowing of the wind. The second thing is that about approximately 50 million people fell under the rule of the Roman Empire 
when Augustus took his census, but give a type 50 to 60 million people, I believe, to have been under Roman rule alone. Okay? And we're talking about roughly, oh, let's say about 70 BC. I'm not 70 BC, about 25 BC. Okay? Okay, 60, 50 or 60 BC. A lot of the errors on the score. I'm off by 10, 10, uh, 10, 10 years, give or take. I can't just pluck out of my head every detail. Uh, and so, North of the Alps, in fact, more precisely north of the Rhine River, you know, and including a great deal of what we today call France, you had approximately a vast near wilderness, particularly as you move still further north into the heartland of what we would call Germany today, and the Slavic areas. You have huge forests and bogs and heavy soil and very well watered regions there, which involve, in order to quote, civilized, that would have involved fundamentally different technologies. Now, the Roman world represents what Greece would have become had it not been for remarkable figures like Solomon, like Cleisthenes, like Pericles. As I told you, the Greeks self-consciously decided to equalize everything, to create isonomia, put everyone on an equal social footing who was a citizen, man's they subconsciously decided on a direct democracy. The Romans were moving in that direction, but the direction was also a very dangerous one. You could very easily go from a direct democracy into a republic. That is to say, you could go from a system of face-to-face -face democracy into what we euphemistically and absurdly and oxymoronically call a representative democracy, which is a contradiction in terms. No democracy can be representative, and the Greeks understood that. And the Romans would never have called their res publica, or public things, a democracy. So what happened was that just as Greece had been moving up to Solomon's time into class war and tremendous conflict and dead bondage and dispossession of its yeomanry or peasantry to a point where Greece was on the point of breaking out into the same civil wars that were to tear the Roman Republic to pieces, the Greeks somehow sat down and consciously decided not to do that. <laughs> and that is a tremendous historical coup, almost unprecedented in the history of humanity. And decided, over a period of years, roughly 120 years, to transform what easily could have turned into a Roman Republic with all the class divisions, assassinations, and brutalization that Mark Rome could have easily turned into a Roman Republic and decided not to do so. And it took them 125 years to establish the democracy, which continued for 200 years after them, in varying forms, OK? Even when they lost their so-called mankind. Not so, Rome followed the normal course. It went from a republic, which at that time was a yeoman republic, simple, in which virtues were regarded as simple, in which paideia consisted of being vulgar, strong, and you've seen me statuettes of Roman faces, the busts of Romans, severe, strong, powerful, certainly not very knowledgeable, you don't know what's going on there, but that's beside the <laughs> Severe and strong Republican virtue. And we see that transformed progressively or de regressively, increasingly into power battles, factions, class warfare reaching its most serious point and crossroads with the Gracchi. How many of you are familiar with the two Roman brothers, Gaius Gracchi and Tiberius Gracchi, as tribunes, which meant that they were totally immunized by the plebeians, by the plebeians, from any kind of control. That when they said no, an army had to stop. They were supposed to be the purest representative of the people. And about 125 or so BCE, Two stunning equivalents of Solomon suddenly emerge, both brothers, who tried to transfer the power from the Senate, which was basically a patrician body, okay, of elders, representing the wealthiest families, landowners, and whatever you like at home, over to the people. Because they had popular assemblies in Rome. Only many people don't know that. They had at least five assemblies, and the most important assembly was the Plebeian Assembly. I'm translating it into English. And in that assembly, no patrician could show up. <laughs> Understand this. Every noble was excluded. Only a plebe or a member of the what was called the equestrian class, those who could afford to own horses and provide cavalry, 
were permitted to show up. Anyone who was regarded as a patrician, could be a candidate for the Senate, could not show up. And there the tribunes spoke to the people and they were selected, no matter from what class, by the people. And they, according to Roman law, such as it was at that time, were supposed to have the ultimate say. But in point of fact, the reality was that the Senate controlled everything. Using its wealth, using its power, and manipulating, it managed to control it. And there was a vast rabble out there that could be used against the people themselves, a wimpin proletariat. Okay? The Gracchi tried to turn Rome into Athens. They tried to strip the Senate of its power, give the land to the peasantry, as Solomon had done, abolish debt slavery, and essentially make the assembly of the people, the, you know, of the, of the plebeians, make that assembly the ultimate decision-making power, essentially excluding the Senate. And the Senate saw to it that they were both assassinated. And with that, Rome lost its last great barriers and just succumbed, and moved into a republic and was drawn outward into the Mediterranean as a result of the wars of Carthage, into the whole Mediterranean basis, and by around the time of Augustus or the death of Julius Caesar and the battles that took place around that, Octavian, uh, Julius Caesar's nephew, was finally turned into an emperor. Which did not mean that the republic ended, the facade of the republic remained. The Senate was supposed to have the last word. And the famous statement of the Senate, people, uh, and, uh, and of, of Rome, you know, uh, SRVP, which you see on Roman banners. SQR. SQR, excuse me, you're absolutely correct. Senatus Populo uh, Qua Romanus. The SPQR that you see on the Roman banners with the eagles. Thank you for the correction. That SPQR still retained the outward forms of the Republic until finally the Caligulas and the others essentially made it, turned it into a joke. But when Caligula made his horse into a senator, that was pretty much it. That told the senate where, where it was. Although attempts were made repeatedly to revive the republic, and they were finally given up. Now, under those circumstances, the empire now began to expand, was almost drawn out into the Mediterranean, living off tribute, and then requiring the military forces to enforce that tribute. Because it had a very restless world out there. Many of the people did not know Latin. In fact, Greek was often more popular, particularly in North Africa. And then you had the Jews continually engaging in one uprising after another and driving the Romans crazy until they literally had to exterminate them. Drive them out either as slaves or wipe them out physically with the last revolt of Bar Hochma, which I think was about 135 CE, the uh, Jewish zealot of that period. And then on top of that, there were and German tribes were pressing against the frontier. All kinds of peoples were disquieted. And Caracalla turning them all into citizens didn't help. It made all of them taxable. From now on, he had a huge fund of tax resources, which the Romans squandered. Now, a basic feature of that society, as I tried to point out, was that this was not a society that was engaged in capital accumulation. As I pointed out, and I will be very brief, the main job of you accumulating a pile of money through trade was to buy a land and a state and live as much as possible like a patrician who had estates. Or marry into a patrician family and acquire nobility of one kind or another. So this was overwhelmingly a consumer society. And in Rome, where the population is believed to have equal to one million people, you had roughly, while you certainly had people who did real work, the great, a very substantial portion of that population was essentially living on its government subsidies, essentially. And those government subsidies consisted of wheat, grain taken from all parts of the world, and so on and so forth, and all kinds of exotica like tigers and lions, and the games and the breads and the circuses, we know the whole story, and the society began to degenerate. It became decadent, basically, until it was forced by the mission into a care system, which was more Asian than it was Western in character. And within a period of time, it didn't take too much. The empire was divided, they couldn't control it, and finally the Germanic tribes essentially pushed against it and pushed it down. It was something ready to be pushed down. There's one story that in Gaul, for example, at a time when the Franks were beginning to approach one of the Roman cities, the population was still, instead of defending the city from the Frankish 
so-called barbarians, the German tribes, were in fact busy, too engaged in the uh, <coughs> fights that were going on in the, in the, uh, in the uh, amphitheater, in the, in the local Colosseum. <coughs> they couldn't be brought out to, to defend the walls of the city, and the Franks were utterly astonished <coughs> that people were so passive in reaction to any kind of social problem. So the Romans had essentially become totally depoliticized, and they had no reason to be politicized, and they would have been educated to do so. And with that, and we're followed, followed along with the Muslim movement across North Africa, the Mediterranean lake now became very precarious. Arabs at that particular point were invading into Christian areas and taking over a substantial portion of them, having gone over into Spain, where they were to remain for the greater part of a thousand years. And, you know, being stopped almost at the Pyrenees, or in the Pyrenees. You had that kind of situation. They took over Sicily. They were threatening Italy itself. And they took over practically all of Asia Minor and threatened all of Byzantium or the Eastern Empire of the Romans. At that particular point, the question now became where the emphasis of that classical civilization or any type of civilization, aside from what existed in the East, China, and other places, would begin to emerge. Certainly anything that had to do with Europe. And at that particular point, too, we began to see some very fundamental changes that had to occur before Europe could be thoroughly colonized. The first thing was there had to be changes in agriculture. Very important changes. The second thing is that it has been estimated, and I don't know how they arrived at these estimators, that between only four to five million people lived in an area that was quite as large as the Roman Empire, north of the Alps, or north of the Rhine, which 